Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to De La Salle University and the Philippine Lecture Series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, hosted through the International Peace Foundation. My name is Brother Bernard Oka, and I will be your host for this afternoon. Please rise for the Philippine National Anthem. to be led by Brother Michael Broughton, FSC, Associate Vice Chancellor for La Salian Mission. Let us remember that we are in the holy presence of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, source of all wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, you give to humanity the gifts of ingenuity and imagination, that we might expand the boundaries of learning, and thus serve the greater good of the whole human by building bridges of understanding that contribute to a new world culture where peace based on justice is assured for everyone. Bless this our gathering today and bless especially Professor Torsten Wiesel, our honored guest. We humbly make this prayer through your most holy name. Amen. I will continue, O oh my God, to do all my actions for the love of St. John Baptist de la Salle, live Jesus in our hearts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. To formally welcome everyone to this afternoon's event is the President and Chancellor of de la Salle University, Brother Armin Luistro, FSC. A warm welcome to De La Salle University. Dear friends, a great man, Albert Einstein, says, All religions, arts, and sciences are branches of the same tree. All these aspirations are directed towards ennobling a human person's life lifting it from the sphere of mere physical existence and leading the individual towards freedom. In ancient times, people thought science and religion could not coexist, that one disputes the other. However, nowadays, we look at both branches as means for us to develop a better understanding of life, God and the world. At De La Salle University, we honor those who have dedicated their lives 
in making an impact through their respective contributions, discoveries, and developments. Most specially contributions in their communities, spheres of influence, the country, as well as the world. Those whom we have invited to this special convocation and lecture are not just students and faculty from De La Salle University, but most especially students and faculty from other colleges and universities of Metro Manila and nearby provinces. I am most pleased to note the presence of students from science high schools, schools that use a special curriculum for children who are gifted in math and science. These young, budding scientists are also joined by many of our distinguished members of the National Academy of Science and Technology, men and women of science who have significant contributions to their field as a scientist or researcher, our local Nobel laureates. And with you in this auditorium are a number of university presidents, as well as leaders in government, academe, business, and civil society. This afternoon, you and I are here to honor a man of science. Someone who has been affiliated with the best schools and centers of research in medicine, namely the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, John Hopkins University School of Medicine, and the Harvard School of Medicine. An accomplished scientist who has, who has studied how the neurons in the brain are able to see what we see. The work of our man of science was an outstanding breakthrough in neuroscience and in the study of visual perception. And his work has not collected dust in the books and archives of the major libraries in the world. In fact, his work has not only opened new lines of research in the study of the visual cortex, but has also been instrumental in the modern day remedies for cataracts among children and strabismus, which I understand is a scientific term for being cross-eyed. This afternoon, we also honor a man of peace. In the past, we used to be awed by the Renaissance man, men who knew the arts and world literature, men who spoke several languages and who spoke each of them eloquently, men who were just as conversant in philosophy as they were in mathematics and astrophysics, men who knew which wine went best with which dish, men who would indulge in the elegant and the beautiful. Our guest of honor goes beyond what is elegant and beautiful. He also pursues what is just, what is fair, and what is good. Beyond form, he also goes for substance. Our man is a man of science and also a man of peace. He used his stature and success in science to advocate for peace in the world, for human rights, for Mother Earth. He traveled the world to America, back to Europe, to Palestine, to Asia, to use science for peace. He has worked hard so that scientists from the developing world would have a fair chance to also excel in their field. He supported programs that helped spare children from medical conditions that modern science and medicine can very well cure and remedy. He advocated for peace by promoting exchanges among scientists in Israel and Palestine. We are indeed honored by the presence of a Renaissance man and a global citizen par excellence. A global citizen who has transcended borders and has truly done his share in making our world a better place. I am very eager to listen to the lecture of Professor Weasel and I do hope that we will all be inspired to do our share in the task of transforming our society and make this world a better place to live in. On behalf of the academic community here at De La Salle University, I warmly welcome all of you to this Bridges program of the International Peace Foundation. Thank you, Brother Armin. On the occasion of the Philippine Lecture Series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, hosted through the International Peace Foundation, De La Salle University will confer on Professor Torsten N. Wiesel, 1981 Nobel Laureate for Medicine, the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. I now call on Mr. Francis G. Estrada, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of De La Salle University, 
to join Brother Armin Luistro FSC, President and Chancellor of De La Salle University, and Professor Torsten N. Rizzo up here on stage. Please stand at the center. Brother Armin Luistro, FSC, will now read the citation. Whereas Professor Thorsten N. Riesel, born in Uppsala, Sweden, began his scientific career in Carl Gustav Bernhard's laboratory at the Karolinska Institute, where he received his medical degree in 1954, and where he went on to teach in the Institute's Department of Physiology and worked in the Child Psychiatry Unit. Whereas he moved to the United States of America in 1955 to work at the John, John Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he began a fellowship in ophthalmology and in 1958 became an assistant professor. Whereas he joined Harvard University in 1959 beginning a 24-year career that would lead to a pioneering work on the neural basis of visual perception. His studies in collaboration with Professor David H. Hubel showed how visual information collected by the retina is transmitted to and processed in the visual cortex of the brain. Their experiments significantly expanded the scientific knowledge and knowledge of sensory processing were important in the study of cortical plasticity and paved the way for the understanding and treatment of childhood cataracts and strabismus. Whereas in 1983, Professor Riesel joined the faculty of Rockefeller University and under his leadership as president of the university from 91 to 98, 30 new laboratories conducting vanguard research in key areas of biology, chemistry and physics were established. At this university, he remains the director of the Shel Shelby White and Leon Levy Center for Mind, Brain and Behavior. Whereas he was elected president of the Paris-based International Brain Research Organization in 98, and from 2000 to 2009, served as secretary general of the Human Frontier Science Program, an organization based in Strasbourg, France, which supports international and interdisciplinary collaboration between investigators in the life sciences. Whereas in 2007, the Thorsten Riesel Research Institute was established by the World Eye Organization at West China Hospital, Sichuan University in Chengdu, China to engage in basic and clinical research, especially on eye diseases most prevalent in Asia. Wherefore, in recognition, sorry, whereas Professor Weasel has done much work as a global human rights advocate and served for 10 years as chair of the Committee on Human Rights at the National Academy of Sciences and is a founding member of the International Human Rights Network of Academies and Scholarly Societies. Whereas he is a founding member of the Israeli-Palestinian Science Organization a non-governmental, non-profit organization established in 2004 to support collaborative research between scientists in Israel and Palestine. Whereas Professor Weasel has been chair and board member of various scientific centers and institutes across the globe, including China's National Institute of Biological Science, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, the Pew Center on Global Climate Change, the Hospital for Special Surgery, the European Brain Research Institute, the Aeron Diamond AIDS Research Center, and the Population Council. Whereas he has served as member of many distinguished societies, including the Royal Society, the National Academy of Sciences, the Philosophical Society, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, the New York Academy of Sciences, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. 
Wherefore, in recognition of his outstanding achievements as advocate of science for peace and global human rights, the Board of Trustees and the Academic Community of De La Salle University, on the occasion of the Philippine Events Series, Bridges Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, hosted through the International Peace Foundation, are pleased to confer upon Thorsten N. Wiesel, advocate of science for peace and global human rights, educator, researcher, and medical scientist, the degree Doctor of Science, honoris causa. Given in the city of Manila, Philippines, this first day of February, in the year of our Lord, 2010, in the 99th year of De La Salle University. Signed, yours truly, President and Chancellor, Francis G. Estrada, Chairman, Board of Trustees. Mr. Francis G. Estrada will read the authority from the Board of Trustees of De La Salle University. Upon the resolution of the Board of Trustees of De La Salle University, Incorporated, in accordance with the pertinent provisions of Republic Act No. 7722, otherwise known as the Higher Education Act of 1994, and Memorandum Order No. 59, Series of 2007, of the Commission of Higher Education, dated December 3, 2007. De La Salle University hereby confers the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa upon Professor Thorsten N. Weasel, Manila, Philippines, February 1st, 2010. Signed, Brother Ermin A. Luistro, FSC, President and Chancellor, and yours truly. Thank you. To impose a doctoral hood, are Mr. Francis Estrada and Brother Armin Luistro, FSC. <laughs> to impose the doctoral cap is Mr. Francis Estrada. to present the diploma is Brother Armin Luistro, FSC. Congratulations, Professor Thorsten and Wilson, Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa. We now... for an intermission number from the renowned De La Salle University Chorale.
Thank you, De La Salle University Chorale. Ladies and gentlemen, as you now know, this event bridges dialogues towards a culture of peace, a program hosted through the International Peace Foundation. To tell us more about the Bridges program, may I call on stage the chairman of the board of directors of the International Peace Foundation, Mr. Uva Morovitz.
Magandang hapon po, and welcome to the third ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation, under the patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the country's major universities. Having started in November 2009, Bridges will now be continuously held in the Philippines, Thailand, and Cambodia until April 2010, involving the participation of Nobel laureates and other eminent keynote speakers and artists. The third ASEAN series of Bridges is an independent contribution to the Decade for Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, which was initiated by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows a series of 350 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in the Philippines, Thailand, and Malaysia since 2003. The pluralistic program of Bridges highlights the International Peace Foundation's intercultural and transdisciplinary approach towards peace. The foundation doesn't take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where representatives of science, politics, economy, culture, religion, the media, and youth can meet, share their viewpoints, listen to each other, and find mutual ways of understanding and cooperation. Therefore, the foundation itself is a bridge and a facilitator between different language groups in our divided societies, where politicians speak another language than artists, and business and religious leaders another one than scientists. In a highly interdependent world, Problems cannot be solved either by one of these language groups only, but by working together. After the success of bridges in the Philippines, Thailand, and Malaysia, the International Peace Foundation has now been invited by other ASEAN countries to build further bridges towards peace and international understanding by expanding its program in Southeast Asia to stimulate the intellectual, scientific, and cultural exchange in the region. And the aim of Bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Southeast Asia with their multiple cultures and faiths, as well as with peoples in other parts of the world to promote understanding and trust. The events aim at building bridges with local universities and other institutions in Southeast Asia to establish long-term relationships with Nobel laureates in all fields, which may result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. By enhancing science, technology, and education as a basis for peace and development, the events may lead to a better cooperation for the advancements of peace, freedom, and security in the region with the active involvement of the young generation, ASEAN's key to the future. This is why Bridges is not designed as a one-time event and then everything is over again and forgotten, but as a continuous process of synergies to make the series of events a sustainable success for the Philippines, for Thailand, Cambodia, and for Southeast Asia as a whole. I'm grateful to Brother Armin Luistro and De La Salle University as well as to our other partners and sponsors who have enabled us to make the idea of bridges a reality. I would like to say thank you for every, everyone present today for taking part in this program. May it help us to facilitate a new culture of peace through dialogue, transcending its definition as merely the absence of war or armed conflict into a new understanding what the basis for peace is, education. In this spirit, we welcome today Professor Thorsten Wiesel, a Nobel laureate for medicine, who has agreed to come to the Philippines to support the events. We all look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo lahat.
Thank you, Mr. Morovitz. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached the most anticipated part of our event. Our keynote speaker was recognized for his pioneering work on the neural basis of visual perception. Today, he will share with us his thoughts on science for peace. Please help me in welcoming the recipient of the 1981 Nobel Laureate for Medicine, Professor Torsten N. Wiesel. Thank you uh, for the welcome and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, obviously a great honor for me to come here and be awarded an honorary doctorate in science. And uh, I'd like to thank the university, the, the chairman of the board, and I thank the Estrada and President of the university, uh, brother Gregory Armin, really to for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, come here and uh, give you some of my thoughts about uh, uh, science and peace. Now. I'm not an expert on in, in this area as a, I'm not a politician. I am a scientist. I spent 40 years in a laboratory and then in my late last uh, uh, 15 or so years, I have been trying to do things as you heard from my uh, previous communications of what my background is like. So um, now before I enter, I also must give credit to uh, the uh, International Science for Peace Foundation. You just heard from the chairman of uh, the foundation, uh, Uwe Marowitz. Uh, and this is, is a man who created this. He had the idea and he has been able to successful on his own sort of create this uh, organization that provides information, knowledge, interaction, uh, in the Southeast Asian region. I think he, he, it's a tremendous contribution. I think we should uh, give him a warm applause for all this work he has done. <laughs> now, uh, it's, you can ask, how it is possible to have a serious discussion about science and peace in the confused world in which we live. Daily we learn about killings, indifferent wars, insurrections, attacks, and the madness of suicide bombers, the collapse of the world economy, global warming, and statistics showing that nearly half of the world population live in extreme poverty and perhaps two dollars a day. Now, for myself, I grew up in a large mental hospital outside Stockholm where my father was a, a health psychiatrist. So I feel right at home with this craziness in which we all live. However, trained as a medical doctor, and a brilliant scientist, I must ask, what can we do to cure the illness of the society? <coughs> or is it too late? Now, 
In my talk, I, I'm going to make three, uh, bring up three issues. And the first one, uh, I've decided to say a few words about the peace of mind, because as a neuroscientist, this comes natural to think about this issue. And the second, I will talk. I decided to choose uh, three in, among the Nobel laureates, particularly in peace, but also in science, who have made an important contribution for peace as scientists. And then at the end, I will make a few comments about why I am here and why I have become interested in these issues, as you heard again from what uh, Brother Armin said um, in my curriculum vitae. Now, it's difficult to talk about peace without talking about war. And growing up in, growing up in Sweden during the 1930s, I'm old enough, so I remember <laughs> as a young man what happened in the 30s. I witnessed the events that led to the Second World War and observed the increasing tension among the leaders and the people of different countries. So as a student, I listened to Adolf Hitler on the radio whipping up entire audiences at huge rallies through his skill as a demagogue and orator, and thereby, thereby creating mass hysteria with the audience screaming, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. This phenomenon is quite interesting from a brain scientist's point of view, how fragile the mind is to the, to the so that a powerful orator with simple and destructive ideas can easily seduce individual minds and in an, in an entire population. We still don't understand how this occurs and how to protect individuals from being afflicted. Thus, my first thought, as I mentioned, is trying to address the type of science, of the topic of science and peace to explore the peace of mind and wonder if by gaining peace in our minds, we could, as individuals, through cooperation with other people, have a bat better chance of building peace in the world. Again, as a neuroscientist, I'm particularly conscious of the potential contribution to the prevention of war that can be made through better understanding of how the mind works and how it influences behavior especially as it relates to aggression and violence. After all, war is the result of an abnormal state of mind, a yin and yang situation in which the forces of good and evil is upended. By fostering positive alliances across races, cultures, and religions, we reduce tensions and barriers that could otherwise lead to war. In the world of science, this interaction occurs naturally because the language of science crosses races, culture, and religions. For that reason, science can serve as an instrument for peace. This, the picture, um, this, this picture is just uh, a peaceful picture from Sweden, uh, just to give you a sense of the balance between Hitler and the peaceful nation. Uh, so, here we have uh, uh, a piece, uh, the Nobel picture of the Nobel uh, coin at, at the board you get a, a gold piece like this and uh, and the question then has Zion played a role in fostering peace so this is what I like to explore 
Uh, and, one, and therefore, as I said, I focused on the scientists who have played a role. Now, since this Nobel Prize is given, in peace is given by Norwegian Parliament since 1901, and they have given out, uh, I think, uh, nearly 100 individuals and organizations of this award. Now, before I, I, I like to discuss the contribution made by the individuals that I will list shortly, mention shortly, uh, let me read a quote from Albert Einstein that he made shortly after the end of the Second World War. As you know, Einstein's name, Einstein's name, Einstein's name came up uh, earlier today, and I, again, I'd like to uh, quote, uh, quote him. So, and again, I don't know if you sitting in the back, it might be impossible to read this, but I will, I will read the quotation. Now I quote, the time has come now when man must give up war. It's no longer rational to solve international problems by resorting to war. Now that an atom bomb, such as a bomb exploded in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, can destroy a city, kill all the people in the city, we can see that we must now make use of man's power of reason in order to settle disputes between nations. In accordance with the principle of justice, we must develop international law, strengthen the United Nations, and have peace in the world from now on. Now, since that end of the war, uh, Fortunately, it didn't mean the end of atomic uh, testing and building our weapons. It's, uh, it's important to keep in mind that there were eminent scientists who were instrumental in the development of atomic weapons used in the war against Japan. In a sense, the scientists had let the genie out of the bottle. However, before long, several of the same scientists who participated in the development of the atomic bomb became the main advocates for the limitation of these weapons. Robert Oppenheimer in the United States and Andrei Sakharov in the Soviet Union came to mind as they became among the most prominent of persecuted spoke Persian against the use of atomic bomb. Now, for the balance, I think it's important to keep in mind that nuclear energy is also an important source of clean electrical power. When in view of our current situation with the global warming, it, it, and in, so in the future it becomes still more important to, in saving the world from overheating. Actually, many countries, as you have seen, are now deciding in China and in India and in the United States to increase the production of nuclear plants for energy. Now, the first person I, I'd like to discuss is is Linus Pauling. Uh, you are the student, uh, the students in the audience uh, may not, you may have heard of his name in chemistry. He was, uh, he received the Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, in, uh, in 1954. Uh, he was working on protein structure and he actually was a man who had the idea about the helical structure that, uh, of protein molecules. And this idea was um, uh, taken up by Francis uh, Crick and Jim Watson when they did the double, double helix of the DNA molecule. Actually, he was one of the main competitors trying to solve the problem of the structure of DNA. Now, he also, um, he also received the Peace Prize 
because he has for a decade or more uh, led uh, himself a ceaseless campaign against nuclear weapons testing, which at the time was a, a major problem for, for people who were uh, fearful of, of the spread of radiation that was caused by the nuclear testing. Uh, and, um, and he was arguing against the spread of these weapons and their use uh, in, in, in all, any warfare uh, that, uh, as a means to solve international conflict. So he was, uh, he has actually made a petition, was signed for of 10,000 scientists from all over the world uh, against uh, the use of nuclear power. And as you know, today uh, uh, Obama has again announced that he is going to fight for a nuclear-free world. Um, that is a nuclear weapon-free world. Uh, some. I lived through this period, and, and this was a dangerous time of the Cold War between the United States and, and, and Soviet Union, uh, where people were afraid, as I said, for radiation and also for an all-out nuclear war. I have colleagues who actually moved to Australia in order to uh, be on a safer part of the world. Uh, this is a... a picture of, of uh, Linus Pauling and the later Peace Prize winner, Bishop Tutu, and Hodgkin, who was a physicist, Nobel laureate in science, at the memorial uh, of Hiroshima bombing. Now, because of, of this campaign that uh, Pauling did, he was accused of being a communist. This was during the McCarthy era in the United States. That's at the time when I came over to the United States in 55, at the peak of, of, of this uh, period. And, um, but in spite of, of this persecution and his courage in responding to, to the Inquisition by not giving names, etc., he became and still is one of the heroes in the world of science, and I think perhaps uh, broader than that, for chose for his courage and, uh, and uh, dedication. The next, uh, we will come to the other person I mentioned, uh, Sakharov, um, Andrew Sakharov. He, he, he was very important for the development of the hydrogen bomb in Russia. The United States developed the hydrogen bomb in 1952. That's a, the, the most effective. It's, a, it's a, people have said at least an order of magnitude more effective than the old nuclear bombs. And so it was a devastating kind of development for it. And uh, Oppenheimer in the United States and, and Sakharov in you know, Soviet Union were both part of this development and both ended up as being very, very uh, vocal uh, once they uh, understood the consequences fully, vocally opposed to this. So he, Sakharov, um, received uh, the Peace Prize in 1975 and the quotation is, for his fearless personal commitment in upholding the fundamental principle for peace between men, and that that is a powerful inspiration for all true work for peace. Now, uh, I think uh, perhaps in part influenced by Linus Pauling, who had his campaign against nuclear weapons, Sakharov also began to speak out against the government's nuclear and also some of the other policies and social policies. So in spite that he had received two Lenin Prizes, one Stalin Prize, and being elected to the Academy of Science at the age of 32, he was for the rest of his life persecuted for his point of views on arms policies, legal issues, and human rights. So for many of us uh, in the world of science, he became like Linus Pauling, 
an icon, a person deeply respected and admired for his continuous and his courage. I think I mentioned these two people because I think we need role models in life for people who have an independent mind, who have knowledge and understanding, who are willing to fight for what they think is right. And these two people, uh, I like to mention in that context. Now, uh, unfortunately, the nuclear armament race is still going on. As you know from newspapers, there are both in Iran and in North Korea, there are active uh, attempts being made to develop at least the basis for producing atomic weapon. And, and in some North Korea, I think, has succeeded to some extent. And if so in order to monitor and, and protect us all from such developments, uh, uh, the there is an International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA. And the director of, of that agency uh, un until December this year, for over 10 years, was this man, Mohammed el Um And he and the Atomic Energy uh, Agency received the Peace Prize in, in 2005. I just mentioned that because I wanted to bring to your mind, you say he's just talking about history and all things happen. But today, this, we are still living in an age where atomic warfare is a reality. And that we have to, therefore, I want you, young and old, to know that we still have the problem ahead of us, in front of us. Next, I, I like to discuss another issue that also uh, we have uh, in front of us, and that has to do with the with the landmine issue. And um, the, in 1997, Judy Williams, and and who was director of an international campaign of bans of landmines, and this was a an, a, the campaign was. A, Hundreds of NGOs were involved in this campaign, but Judy was sort of the director in, uh, in this effort. And um, I was partly involved through Human Rights Watch to, uh, in, in, uh, in this effort. So the, um, right now there are over 100 million anti-personnel mines scattered over large war-torn areas uh, located on several continents. And such mines, they are lying there in, in, on the ground, it's often partly hidden, mined all, all too often maim and kill indiscriminately and are a major threat to the civilian population, particularly children, and also influence the uh, development of some areas because of the danger. So the treaty against landmines was signed in 1997 in Ottawa by close to about 100 countries. And uh, at present time, I think countries have been added, 156 countries have signed the treaty. But the major powers have not yet done so, powers like Russia, China, United States, not even in the Obama administration has, has signed. So many scientists, as I said, will all continue, continue to be active in this effort. Now here in the, in the Philippines signed the Mine Ban Act, that's in, in, in 97 when they, they received the prize. Um, and uh, it was ratified in 2000. But as of July 2009, that is last summer, the bill was still in the working group level three here in the Philippine parliament. And recently the Philippine government has stated that it hoped that the law will pass before the next round of national elections in May. 
I encourage those involved in the process to do everything possible to get that bill passed to law. So this is uh, Norman Borlo was an amazing man, and uh, this is now we come to where science really can can be productive to help to to uh, peace and indirectly by providing uh, help to those who are starving and and need more food. Uh, and he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. Uh, for his lifelong effort to alleviate world hunger and suffering. And to me, he's a shining example of uh, uh, an individual who worked with science for peace. His work has saved millions of lives and brought together in this developing his uh, uh, work uh, from scientists from America, Africa, and Asia. And the title of his Nobel lecture was The Green Revolution, Peace and Humanity. It took Berlow some years to achieve this, his goal. Um, but he stated at one point, and here I quote him, in summarizing the accomplishment of the Green Revolution during the past three years, I wish to restate that the increase in several, in cereal production, rice, maize, and wheat, especially wheat, has been spectacular and highly significant to the welfare of millions of human beings. It is still modest in terms of total needs. So Berlo has, through his science, uh, done more for peace than most other scientists you can think of. Because I think hunger and starvation is a main source of unrest, and that in terms to, to uh, War. Yeah, this is a famous double helix that uh, Watson and Crick uh, uh, discovered. And uh, I show that because um, of, of the importance of genetics and as a next stage. It's still true today that the total need for food has not been made, and the number of people who die from chronic hunger every day is staggering. Is it, is it, I think I saw a figure of 26,000 people a day die uh, from, from hunger. So we must try to meet this need. But the revolution in genetics should make it possible to increase the food supply products and also the, the character of what uh, is content in these various seeds and should give us hope or rational relief through science. Now, it seems important here to make the point that Burlo genetically modified food products by cross breeding, which is in principle the same approach that is used today is more efficient direct genetic ma manipulation. This is a very important point I like to keep. The crossbreeding is, after all, a selection of, of the species that can assist uh, uh, weather conditions, insects, etc. So it's an error and trial. Now with genetics, you can actually manipulate genes specifically to see that they have the character that they will be able to uh, grow under adverse conditions. Now, I had the pleasure to meet Berlo in China a few years ago, a couple of years before he died. And, and uh, he, he's, 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 he was the most charming and modest uh, gentleman. And I asked him about the genetic, what he felt about the genetic approach. And he said, this is obviously a very logical extension of his own work. And he welcomed it as a means to hasten and facilitate the creation of improved grains and other agricultural products. Now, this is just a nice picture of, of uh, grains. Um, 
No, it's well known, uh, and it varies from country to country, uh, that the production of genetically modified food, the so-called GM food, um, has caused some controversy, which from a scientific point of view is hard to find any real justification for. Policies in some countries against the use of GM food seems not to be in the best interest for the farmers in terms of yield per acre, and most importantly, such regulations deprive needy and starving people of food. This new technology is truly a great example of how science, when applied constructively and intelligently, can serve to benefit mankind. So I had uh, a meeting this uh, morning with your Prime Minister, Gloria Arroyo, and we discussed uh, this issue. And uh, it's clear that this still uh, here in the Philippines is a controversial issue, even if it has support from the government. There are, there are other uh, uh, resistance groups that kind of have made it difficult to fully take, take full advantage of this technology. And I hope that in the future that, uh, since there are still many poor people here who need uh, better nourishment, that uh, this hinder for improved health will be removed. So this is, um, no, I like in, in the last part just to make a few points, uh, kind of more conversational point. Um, um, I mean, I say here that I, My, the work that I've done is, is, if you look at what I've said before, the work, my interest in, is, is minor and not really of great importance, but to me they're important because, and I, I, I like just to, to uh, give you a sense why I'm standing here and what made me uh, in, be invited. I should also clarify that my, my friend and colleague Eli Wiesel here to the, to the, to the left on the screen, um, who received his uh, Peace Prize in 86 uh, for, I don't know if you have read this book, he's written uh, about the Holocaust and background and, and consequences uh, eloquently and beautifully. And so, so uh, um, but except for the name, I have, I'm not related to, to, to <laughs> I'm not even Jewish, so that that uh, uh, is often uh, confusing. So I just wanted to. I, I as you heard, I received Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for uh, in '81. So, but uh, uh, Eli Wiesel, uh, he he uh, set up a foundation. Uh, uh, to, together with the King of Jordan, uh, for for um, uh, to, to combat intolerance, indifference, and injustice through international dialogue and youth focused programs, uh, and uh, he has a range. Uh, he had annual meeting in Petra. It's called the Petra conferences. Uh, if you have a get the chance to go to Petra in Jordan, you should, because it's beautiful, interesting. Um, and at this Petra conference for Nobel laureates, there was very intensive discussion about peace and, and these issues that are related to uh, try to create an international dialogue. And uh, the kind of uh, thoughts and th Freeman Dyson, uh, who is a f well known uh, physicist at the at Princeton's at Princeton's uh, at the international uh, international physics uh, center, uh, he wrote a book called Imagined Worlds, 
imagined world. And I like to quote him. Uh, do you have a quote? No. Um, the, uh, this is a quote from Freeman Dyson, um, a physicist. The international community of scientists may help to abolish war by setting example to the setting an example to the world of practical cooperation across barriers of nationality, languages, and culture. You hear this coming up over and over, across barriers of religion, beliefs, etc. So, so in language and culture. And this is the early, I like to quote this because it's exactly the way I think about what, uh, what I like to see happen. Now you already know about, about uh, where I come from, from Sweden and etc. So I, I will just uh, uh, mention that many of the program, I will mention a few programs very briefly, it was carried out in the spirit of perhaps science and education across barriers of nationality, language and culture. So, so first I'd like to mention, the, uh, th this, is a, this is a picture of, of me when I was president and we, we created the chi children's center at the university and uh, I sort of slide down one of these, <laughs> just to, uh, for fun. Can't take yourself too seriously in this world. It's li but life is so serious, you have to lighten it, you have to smile uh, and, and not be taken down by the problems. You have. So the New York Academy of Science, um, I, was, uh, I was president or chairman of the board for six years, and 2000 to 2006. The, uh, the interesting thing with the New York Academy of Science is that it has 26,000 members and it's over half of them are in foreign countries. So it's a truly international, international academy. And so the name is, is somewhere, is a misnomer because it it's, it's extends over, over uh, so many, uh, over the whole world, 140 countries. And so the aims of the academy is, are to create a global community of scientists and to benefit humanity by advancing knowledge about science and related issue. So you have a program and now through the internet, through the communication, we have brief e-briefings that we call them where you can listen to scientists speak and, and we have a dialogue with various members and we have a region meeting in different uh, countries, etc. So this is another way in trying to reach out to try to create a global environment, scientific environment. Uh, th this, um, this is a picture of the academy is in one of these buildings on the 40th floor. And it was interesting, this building was just built after 9-11 and nobody wanted to move in, uh, so we moved in. Uh, and now it's very fully occupied. Well, this is, uh, at the New York Academy, we have um, every year uh, annual gala and we give uh, young scientists awards and here uh, is uh, group of young scientists who, who received the award and, uh, and um, the, um, thank you. And here is a young woman, a young woman who received the award and she brought her baby with her. I'd like to show that just because of, uh, you know, the gender issue in science. Uh, we are trying to do our best to see if that's eliminated. This is another Nobel laureate, Rod McKinnon, who did beautiful work on ion channels at the Rockefeller, his great friend. Uh, but again, this to have meetings and see each other is, is important. 
So the other next organization that was also mentioned by uh, Brother Armin is uh, the, the, what we call ESRI, the International Brain Research, National uh, International Brain Research Organization, which uh, is in my own field, in neuroscience. Uh, and I, I was president of that for, for six years also. Uh, in 98 to 2004. But it was sponsored after the war and UNESCO was again very important in, in sponsoring and it was, uh, has now over 60,000 members all over the world. And, um, and its main focus is really to try to develop neuroscience in the developing world. world. So we have uh, now divided the world into region in Africa, Latin America, uh, the Far East, uh, Eastern Europe, etc., And we have resources through a magazine we publish so each region can receive money to have summer schools and give stipend, travel stipend to students. And so this is a way of, again, trying to, to build now in the field of neuroscience an international community. And I think uh, through, again, through internet, we have, uh, I think, a very dynamic kind of interaction. And I would like to see more organization of this nature in the sciences, where we actually create a community that, and the, the regions, the chair of the region have their own committees, and the chair of the region is part of the executive committee. So the voice of the region is very important. I think that's what critical in all the work in developing countries is to see, listen, and learn from the local information. Yeah, I was uh, Secretary General of another program from 2000 to 2009 called the Human Frontier Science Program. This is a government-supported organization. There are now 15 countries, including uh, China, uh, not China, but I wish China had joined, but it was started by Japan, Makassoni, when he was Prime Minister. And uh, now we are, uh, India has joined, Australia, Korea, South Korea and uh, the major Western countries and, and the European Union. So we give, uh, we give uh, grants to um, groups of scientists uh, from different continents and also give a postdoctoral program. So postdoctoral programs, so it's very competitive, but I wish you, those of you who are students that you, you look at the uh, Human Frontier Science Program, HFSP uh, website, and you can s look at the program, and then you already apply for support from this. It's competitive, but, you know, try. Um, I think, uh, again, um, uh, this is a meeting of the International Brain Research Organization. We ha meetings are important. I mean, you can say this is people just meet and have a good time. But that's, uh, that's, uh, that's important. Uh, here is Human Science Program. We had the meeting in Paris, and here you see the, the uh, to the right you see faculties talking about things, and to the left is the president of Human Frontiers Program, Masao Ito and myself. So, now, uh, again, Brother Armin mentioned the Israeli-Palestinian organization. This is the most uh, difficult thing. Again, UNESCO played a role here. There was a meeting in 2003 uh, in Paris, UNESCO's headquarters. And um, uh, at that time, we had a I organized a symposium in, uh, in sort of focus on human rights and uh, invited uh, Palestinian and Israelis come to that. And we, as a result of this, we created this organization we call IPSO, trying to build bridges between Palestine and Israel. Now this is, a, as you all know, it's complicated, but when we asked for, the idea was to have uh, teams, that is Israeli and Palestinian scientists work together, cooperate in various projects. So they have to submit a grant in, in uh, whichever discipline they work in. And uh, to our surprise, we, we have now over the years got over 100 uh, applications, and, and the 
they were reviewed, and some of them are, are excellent. So we now have, we now know that there is a scientific competence both in, in uh, of course, in pa Israel is well known, but in Palestine, uh, there is a, a real talent to design, and we'd like to see to it uh, that they can be supported. And this is sort of a, in some ways, a mental problem since Israeli science is, is by a high level of excellence. But by working together with our colleagues in, in Palestine, we, we uh, have seen in a number of cases that this has led to very productive result. But um, uh, we have had trouble because of the political situation. Uh, right now it's a moratorium between Israel and Palestine after the Gaza. So, and we have also had problems raising funds because of the political situation. But I still believe that, that this is uh, the way to go and to create peace in the world is that, that country, even if countries are in conflict and have difference of opinion, they should try to find common interests and common roads to work together. So now I'd like to conclude. Now this is another meeting I had with students. I, you know, it's, it's very rewarding. You have seen several pictures with me standing surrounded by by young scientists, and I think this is one of the rewards of my my later years have been just to be able to interact and and stimulate the, the young scientists. Now here we are looking at the Swedish sky. The clouds in Sweden are, are just very beautiful, and you don't get a sense of that here. So I like to conclude my lecture by by saying I have discussed a variety of issues which to my mind all relate to science and peace. My first point that we need to deal with the problem of peace of mind seems critical and perhaps the most complex since it involves the structure of society in terms of education, health and culture. However, even if challenging, even if challenging we all can approach and take part in our own way and in our own neighborhood. So this is sort of a positive message that I take to each of you that, you know, the peace is, our mind is in the families, in society, in all levels up to the highest political level. And you all should and must take part in that process. Now, in uh, looking at Nobel Prize winners, uh, I, I, I like when I would try to think about literature. A lecture, I learned a great deal and, uh, about these extraordinary individuals. And, uh, and I think, as I said before, they can serve as a role model for all of us. And lastly, since I'm a practical person, I do I like to do things, uh, and as you heard, there are various programs in which I participated in. So finally, I'd like to end with a quote by Einstein, uh, whom I feel also, he really should have received a Nobel Prize, a Peace Prize, I think. You know, he's probably one of the most quoted persons in terms of peace and humanity that uh, you can think of. Now he believes, as I do, that scientists can play an active and influential role in promoting peace and cooperation and human rights. He said, and now I quote then Albert Einstein, science and art are the only, only effective messengers for peace. They, they tear down national barriers. They are far better assurances of international understanding than treaties. So I thank you for listening and, and mara, mara min salamat po.
Thank you very much, Professor Riso. Ladies and gentlemen, please. our esteemed guest has been most kind to agree to answer some questions at this point of the program. We would like to um, just request the students from the different science high schools who are in the audience to please stand and be recognized. The students from the Philippine science, the different science high schools, where are you? Oh, there they are. Okay, please stand. Thank you. We will now be opening the floor for those of you, including you students, who want to ask questions. There is a microphone on each of the two center aisles for you to use. Please introduce yourselves and tell us your organization or school affiliation before you ask your questions. Please feel free to approach the mics now. Good afternoon. I'm Cora Claudio. I'm not a student. I'm president of Earth Institute Asia. I have two questions for Professor Wiesel and an invitation to the audience. Let me start with the invitation. On Wednesday at 6.30 to 7.30 in the evening, we are broadcasting a special interview of Professor Wiesel over DZRH, uh, AM radio, Channel 9, and uh, Internet. And there is a flyer that you can pick up at, as you exit for the address. My two questions. Thank you, Professor, for discussing how we may promote cooperation among scientists. But I think we really also need to promote cooperation between scientists and leaders and the general public. Government resources are currently uh, usually allocated to programs with popular appeal. Even uh, discussions uh, in the ongoing uh, presidential debates are focused on such uh, topics like corruption, the fate of President Arroyo, which have mass appeal. Science, unfortunately, does not have mass appeal. Based on your uh, familiarity with the Filipino culture, especially with a Filipino wife, who is also a messenger of peace, being an artist, Mrs. Uh, Lizette uh, Wiesel, and your experience in institutions that have successfully mobilized resources, what advice can you give to make science, including research and development, more appealing for support of the government and the private sector. And my second question is a result of my discussion with brother uh, Manuel Pajarillo just now, who noted that more than 50% of scientific research in the world is in the area of defense. I wonder if that is resource driven, and uh, if so, how can we encourage scientists to devote more research on areas like agriculture and, and other more important areas for improving the quality of life and not destroying it. Yeah, you know, thank you for, uh, for your questions. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, I mean, in, in answer to the last question, the, the government Often, I think uh, my experience from the United States and other countries is that people in political leadership in parliaments and government tend not to have a strong background in, in science and engineering and, and uh, areas which I think in the future are going to be critical for the development of the new economy in biotechnology and, and uh, generally in technology. So uh, the, the uh, obvious way is that the government should see to that they must have advisors, science advisors, which uh, can give them a balance and informative uh, input in legislations and develop new policies. And that, uh, 
I know during the American uh, world after the Second World War, most of the science advisors to the presidents in the United States have been physicists. And the reason for that is obviously that, that of the nuclear problem. They wanted to be sure that, that, that this um, tremendous danger of nuclear war that the people in, who gave advice to the government were fully informed and knew about this. Now, this is still a problem, and I think uh, the person who is now, uh, even Obama administration, who is a science advisor, is, is also have a background in physics, see, but he's also more a biologist. He was in Woods Hole, which is a marine biological station in Massachusetts. But the uh, emphasis has been, my, my feeling has been that uh, the, f the revolution in science in the in end of last century and in this in, two th in this century will be in biology because of the development in genetics and proteomics and and etc and the new technologies developed to study so i think uh, i had predicted that obama will appoint <laughs> biological more life science type of uh, advisor but in the future i think uh, uh, that should be the case. Many governments do not have, I mean, the United States still doesn't have an, uh, a cabinet minister in science. And my advice to government would be to have a, in your cabinet a, a, a science uh, appointment. Somebody who can advise because it's hard to make any decision today in social policies, in, in health science, in any area, if you don't have good scientific advice on, in the cabinet. In terms of trying to encourage science to do different, to f focus less on, on uh, as you say, in physics or similar, uh, to, to look at agriculture. And that has to do with funding. I mean, the funding today in the United States um, is, is very much on health science. The N National Institute of Health has a billion or have a, have a support of from the from the government of 30 close to 35 billion dollars now if you look at the support for agriculture it's just a, a small fraction of of that through the national science foundation so i think if if and i don't know how the support is in this country for agriculture but if you provide sufficient funds and support you will have, because there are so many interesting questions to be asked in agriculture, like in any other area, that uh, you will have uh, good science developed in, in area. And I think the reason for bringing up Norman Borla in my talk was because I think he sh is a model for uh, how uh, science, and he, he was, uh, you know, the thing he did was very simple. Mendel did cross-breeding <laughs> in his famous development of genetics, as you remember, 1880s. Uh, and so Borla just developed that further, focusing on, on seeds. But uh, now with the genetic revolution, you know, as a young st student, once you, there is an enormous potential. And I know now there are people working on trying to introduce various Vitamins, uh, you can vaccinate people through oral, uh, through, through uh, various uh, food products. So I think uh, this is new, a new opening of the world into in science. I hope I answered reasonably well. Yes. yes. Uh, professor, this is uh, Brother Roly Dizon, former president of the La Salle and currently professor of uh, religion and ethics. You mentioned in your talk that there is no scientific justification to oppose uh, GM foods. Could you please expound on that? Genetically modified food, because in this country there is, no? So could you please expound wh what you meant by there is no scientific justification to the opposition? Yeah. You know, it's, I'm, I'm not an agricultural person, I'm a neuroscientist, but my understanding 
uh, and I have discussed this with, with Norman Borla and many other scientists in that field uh, who cannot uh, understand uh, what's the rational resistance to this. And uh, like all experiments, when you modify, is the same as in crossbreeding, you, you must be sure to see and test and see that safety issues come up. But rationally, if you know what you're doing, what you need, the different genes do in a plan, and how to put in genes that provide resistance to certain uh, insects or, or uh, uh, make plants more resistant to dry weather, which could be very important in the future here, even here in, in the Philippines. The rain, uh, you know, I, I was told that the rain season is now changing. Uh, which is very important for agriculture. So I think one has to be practical and not say no, because it can have hazard. You know, I mean, the nuclear issue is, is a case. I took that up because here we have scientists doing, as I said, letting the genie out of the bottle and this cause atomic war and all these problems we have today. At the same time, it's a main, major source of energy and will perhaps become a dominant one in the future. So we have to, we have to balance our, and be rational and practical and see what can we do with this technology that is a benefit of mankind. And at the same time, have precautions to see that it doesn't cause damage. So that balance is, is uh, of course, uh, each country uh, is making their own policies. The United States, GM food is not a problem. In Europe, it's a problem because there was some propaganda, the danger and so on. So, and here I hear also a, a great deal of resistance. And I think, uh, I mean, it's, it's not to the benefit of the people. That's all I can say. And you have to, as a scientist and as a human being and member of a society, you have to think about what is in the benefit of, of the people. And I think uh, this policy of preventing the use of GM food is not in the best interest of the people. Who are starving, as I said, 26,000 people a day dying from starvation. So that's uh, not to be laughed at. This lady. Good afternoon, Dr. Weasel. I'm Dr. Cecil Likuan, the Dean of the College of Physical Therapy from De La Salle Health Sciences Institute. I would love to ask you this question. The world is divided in terms of their opinion as to stem cell therapy. Since you're a neuroscientist, what is your stand on the matter? Thank you. Yeah. So, I think uh, my, my experience is uh, that uh, any, anyone who, any new development, anything new is met with resistance. And, and uh, the only way to, I think, to, is through education and information. And I think we now are living in a world where uh, through the internet and we, we, uh, will, have a, we will have a young, young population that have possibilities to be better educated, better informed than we were when we grew up, in my, certainly in my generation. So I think uh, I b believe firmly in that through the better informed and population is, the, the more chance for real democracy and less conflict is, is uh, going to be the result. Yes, please. G good afternoon, Professor Wiesel. I am Lance Cathedral from the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. We have just finished studying neurology and we all had fun and we found it really interesting. Um, now we understand that the visual pathway has been uh, studied extensively. What 
are the things that we still do not know? What are the things that still need um, research in terms of a vision? In terms of vision? Yes, sir. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, there was a, a physicist that once told me that uh, you know, in biology, most problems will be solved uh, within the next 50 or so years, but the problem of the brain and how it works still is going to be a major issue within sciences 100 years from now. So I think you have to realize that we are very early on, at sometimes uh, at the time of, of Galileo and Kepler <laughs> trying to understand the universe, uh, the universe in our heads is, is still not well understood. I mean, you can see images in, 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 uh, of, of the brain and people say they understand how the brain works, but it's not true. I mean, we have small insights in certain issues, but uh, I think uh, if our level of understanding may be at more of 10% uh, or something of the total. So my work on, on vision was trying to understand how images from the that fall on our retinas, how they are sent, sent. I mean, we have two, three hundred million of photoreceptors in the eye, but it's only one million fibers going into the brain. So the eye do processing, and then from that million fibers into the brain, you have to build up and put together the images that were sent in. And so that was what people have said. We broke the code to one way how this is done. That still means at a very early level of understanding and how we then perceive, how I perceive you as a figure standing there and recognize you, that most of these issues are, are still open for future investigations. So, but it's an exciting area like, like many other areas in science. Thank you. There's a student in the balcony who would like to ask a question. Good afternoon, Professor Weasel. I am Ariza Nokum from Philippine Science High School. I am in my third year. And first off, I would like to read an excerpt from a brochure of the Bridges program. I quote, to facilitate a new culture of peace through dialogue, transcending its definition as merely the absence of war or armed conflict into a new understanding what the basis of what the basis for peace is, and that is education. As a Philippine Science High School student, I am aware that the quality of education in our country is generally retrogressing, particularly in public schools such as mine, for instance, our laboratories, the equipment that we maintain in our school are definite, definitely need improvement. Just this morning, I had, uh, we had an experiment in our research class and we had to share three people, one beaker. That was what we did this morning. And with that, I would like to continue. In order to uplift a culture of peace, through science, I think that improvement needs to be done in the area of scientific education. So I ask, how can this need be addressed? And more particularly, can we as students address this need ourselves? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a very good question and I fully agree with you that uh, it's only, we need to see to that the students have a good education uh, in science as well as in other areas, obviously. And I'm, I brought in my meeting this morning with uh, uh, your Prime Minister, Gloria Arroyo, uh, I brought this up for discussion and asked why is it that education that used to be superb in, in the Philippines uh, and the information I have received is not as, uh, as good as it used to be and that not enough resources are invested. So my, again, if you have a, if you had me as a science advisor to the prime minister, I would say this is the best investment you can do with government money is to support a good education for, for students, not only in science, but also in other areas. And, uh, and then see to that uh, universities and uh, also receive enough 
resources. So it's the good scientists who, who are trained here or go abroad for advanced training never come back because they, they, they don't have the resources to continue to work in their homeland. And so this is, uh, I think, a very important, uh, I think, uh, message for, for, the, for the leaders of the country. Professor, uh, it's President Arroyo, not Prime Minister. Oh, sorry. Although President. there are plans, <laughs> but we, let's not get into that. Uh, uh, <laughs> this, this young lady here, then the gentleman in the balcony. I'm, I'm sorry for, for that. Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Ingrid Ignacio, a student of Malayan High School of Science. I have two personal questions to address to Professor Dr. Wiesel. My first question is, if ever there was a cash prize for the Nobel laureate, where, what, where did you first use it? But if there was none, what personal gratification did, you, did it give you? And my second question is, may you leave an inspirational message to us young scientists? Thank you. Yeah, this, yeah. I I, um, I have a daughter, and uh, most of the money was used for her education. It wasn't much money actually <laughs> at that time. Uh, was, and um, but um, the gratification issue is um, is a is a good question. I, you know, it it um, the negative part is that you are asked to do a lot of things, uh, giving lectures and talks, which... <laughs> <laughs> but the, the good things, both as a, when I was president, uh, as president of an American university, you spend a, a great deal of time trying to raise funds for the university. And as a Nobel laureate, your, your credibility as you talk to, uh, to philanthropes is higher, and you can therefore have an advantage of that. The second advantage is I, I have tried to use my Nobel Award t for the benefit in human rights in trying to develop in, in the various programs I mentioned in my talk. To be Nobel Laureate has been very beneficial in order to get funds and support for the various ideas you have. So it is, uh, if Personally, uh, when I received the award, I received the call in the morning at seven in the morning and from a news agency. So, do you know that you have received the Nobel Prize? Well, I, so, I, my answer was, I just woke up. He said, oh no, I better go and hide. <laughs> so, personally, uh, you know, I'm, I have not sort of, but it has been useful, yes. I don't know. I, I. Uh, it's, it's. Uh, I hate to pontificate, you know. And uh, I think that uh, my hope was that uh, by talking about these various issues in my talk, I would sort of am providing some road models for people who are passionate about. I mean. Linus Pauling and both of them, Linus Pauling and, and Sakharov, were passionate about their science as well as what they think was right. And so the, the message I think uh, uh, that uh, I like to give to young people is that they, uh, if they become scientists, it's just like you have to have a passion for, for the, you have to have good ideas, you have to work hard, and you have to have a bit of luck. But if you all combine these things, I think, uh, and are really serious about going into science, you will be successful. Okay, the young gentleman up there, and then doctor, and then this young man. Hello. Uh, my name is Van Slim. Uh, I'm studying uh, Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Uh, I am going to graduate soon, so I have to ask uh, some questions. 
Uh, my first question is, uh, if I remember right, uh, I think science is also the reason uh, why there is a lot of poverty, uh, there is war, uh, the war tends to progress. Like for example, in the past, uh, people only use uh, spears, knives, swords, sh and shields in their battlefield. And then as science progress, uh, guns, and then tanks, and then uh, atomic weapons, and then poisonous weapons. And then in the future, maybe there will be like robot wanzers or uh, me mecha figures that will be emerging on war. So, so I think uh, based on that, maybe science also has a role to play in the destruction of the world. And also, science has also a role to play in the poverty, in the marginaliz in the marginalization of the world. Like for example, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, at the start of that, uh, there became rich people and there became poor people. And also, right now, uh, medicines are getting more expensive because of the technology advances and hospitals tend to be more expensive. And how can we as scientists or as engineers uh, face these challenges that even if we try to develop something good for the people, yet we don't cause uh, such consequences that will inevitably happen? Okay. We will limit it to that one question. Okay. <laughs> that was, was a nice... Uh little talk there. <laughs> so, uh, that's it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> doctor. I'm Dr. Charles Yu. I'm the vice chancellor. I'm a professor of medicine in our College of Medicine in De La Salle. I was fascinated when you flashed the slide of Adolf Hitler. I know there are many people who have tried to study the brains of mass murderers, of people in crime, but has there ever been any study on people like those who are peacemakers? Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther, people like you and those who are part of these bridges. To try to analyze what makes people violent, yet also what makes people strive for peace. I know not just the anatomy and post-mortem, but maybe living examples of people who harbor peace and to analyze how we can promote peace. The second point is, is there an informal club of Nobel laureates that are like those in the Peace Foundation going around the world to promote science and peace? We were the recent host of Dr. Peter Doherty, which I think is also part of the Bridges program, and he was saying, we're trying to share how they promote sciences among many of the young. And he does that by also speaking. Because you've lived your life in the lab, and now you go around the world talking to people to promote the sciences. Yeah, it's a complicated uh, issue that you raise. As I said, it takes a long time before we, uh, 100 years before we really have a better understanding how the brain works. And I think even in violence, uh, we, our understanding, we, we know that uh, there are certain regions of the brain that, that if stimulated can, in animals for example, can evoke rage. But why some people are, more violent or, and some more peaceful. I think, uh, I think, to my mind, this has to do with education and environment because that's what I emphasize in my talks is that this peace of mind is, is, a, is a broad issue of education, social environment and, and, uh, and, and things of that sort. And uh, I don't think the brain scientists as such are going to be helpful. They can give pills so you sleep better, or you may, your anxiety is going down and so on. But the real understanding of, of how the mind works, I think, has to be 
uh, that we have to have a better self understanding of ourselves. And is this a, so there you have to go into philosophy and, and think about and, and come to understanding of yourself and how, what, what, in which way you can uh, become a better person, uh, less violent, less aggressive, more constructive in your thinking. And I think that uh, that's why every, what I tried to say in my talk, that all of us are part of, of, of the crazy world in which we live and the violence and the corruption and all this stuff. So each person has to deal with that on a very personal level and then through family and extended contacts. I think uh, to study a piece, uh, to study the brain, you know, when, when Einstein died, people were very interested to get hold of his brain and they, and they sectioned the brain and so on and uh, weighed it and so on. But uh, nobody, no, no neuroscientist learned anything why he was such a brilliant person in, in mathematics and physics and why he was such a humanitarian. So these are issues that, that we are not ready to give good answers to. We just have to be amazed of these individuals who can serve as role models for us and they can lead us to, you know, I mean, I've, I've been influenced in my life of individuals who have a certain stature, way of thinking of, and integrity. And we have, we need to have such role models and that's why I brought them up here today. We have time for only one last question. Those of you who have questions, there is an interview in the radio, I think, and you can send your questions during that interview. Uh, so can we have the last question from this young gentleman over here? Good afternoon, doctor. My name is Jose Carlos Tayag. I'm from the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. And I've read a short abstract of your award-winning research. And if I may ask another medically related question, from what I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because of the association of the retinal cells with the neurocortex, upon birth, the first few days, uh, I've read it from the site which uh, states uh, the abstract of your research. It says there that a child whose eye, whose both eyes are open compared to a child with only one eye open would have significantly better development of the brain compared to the child which um, had right. only one eye closed. Now my question is, what about those people who are born blind or those who have congenital eye defects? Would that mean that they would be in some way retarded compared to people who have normal eyesight? Yeah, I mean, you know, a common, not about one child of 10,000 uh, is going to be born with a cataract, that is a cloudy lens, so they can't see clearly. And we know now from the work that David Jubel and I did that if, uh, in monkeys, that if this cataract is not removed within the first months or so after birth, the vision, uh, they won't regain normal vision. They will be more or less blind in that eye. So, so for individuals who are born blind for various reasons, um, there are many reasons. They can be kind of a cortical blindness, they can be, the eye can be a defect, etc. Uh, that part of the brain that uh, is normally occupied to take care of vision can to some extent now be used uh, for other sensory, for audition and for other. So, so the brain is, this part of the brain that normally deal with vision is not completely unoccupied, but can be called upon to uh, work in other sensory systems. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that was all the time we have for the open forum. Thank you all very much. We are most grateful to Professor Riso for most graciously sharing his thoughts, ideas with all of us. We have also reached the end of today's program on behalf of the International Peace Foundation and De La Salle University. I would like to thank once again Professor Tornston and Riesel for honoring us with his presence today. 
and to all of you, especially to all the students from the various science high schools in the Philippines for joining us. Have a pleasant afternoon. <laughs>